Okay, welcome everybody to Management 222 Real Estate Principles. And uh, my name is David Shipley. I'll be the course instructor for this course. And a little bit about myself. We'll start with an introduction. We'll introduce the course briefly. Uh, then we'll talk about some ground rules for the mod. And once we're done with the ground rules, we'll cover chapters two and four, which are the required um, content for this week. So chapter two and four from your ebook. And then we'll help you as we will every week at the end to discuss the topics that you'll need to know for the test this week. So we'll have quizzes each week and then there's a final in week four. This week it's a very short quiz. It's only five questions. That's good and bad, right? There's, there's, it's a very short quiz. There's not a lot going on there. Flip side is if you don't know the content and get a few wrong, then you've already failed the, the quiz because we can't miss too many, right, when there's only five. Each one is worth a lot. It's worth 20% of your score. So be careful on the quiz. Read the questions very carefully, the answers very carefully. And tonight, at the end of the class, we'll spend a few minutes discussing the topics that you'll need to know for the test to prepare you. And I'll be doing that every week so you make sure and get that information each week from this session. Now, it's come to my attention that a few of you are, uh, might be doing this class. This might be your first online class. If it's your first online class, welcome. Uh, Susan, Doug, Marcia, or Andrea, any of you here for the first time as far as an online course, or are you all taking this course as maybe uh, something that you've already done before, uh, where you've already come on before? Any of you on for the first time? Okay, so Andrea, this is your first, this is your first run at it. Um, Doug, Susan, and, and Marcia, maybe you can help uh, Andrew with a few things. Kind of think back in your mind to when you first took your first online course, the kinds of questions that you may have had that first week, that first time. It's kind of scary that first time you go in. And so I'd encourage you tonight to be interactive with the course. Ask any question that you have. Thanks, Marcia. I think it's that way for all of us, even if we don't admit it. <laughs> so I appreciate your comment. Um, Make sure if you have any questions or comments, especially you, Andrea, if you have any concerns, don't feel like, hey, I'm going to waste everybody's time. Please, 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 please just write in any kind of concern or question that you have, no matter how crazy it, it sounds. Um, there are probably others that are going to review the recorded session that could benefit from your questions, right? Thanks, Susan. Appreciate your invitation there. I'd strongly encourage you all to ask anything that you have throughout these courses. Sometimes I get going very fast through the material. That's not because I'm anxious to get through the material. That's just because that's my style. Um, and it's not in any way to indicate that I don't want discussion. So if I start going quickly through the material, stop me at any point, write something in. I'm always looking at the chat box. So put something in there anytime you want about any kind of topic. If I need to finish a thought, I will, and then I'll go back to your question or, or, or comment. But most times I'll stop wherever I'm at and we'll, we'll get to whatever you would like to discuss, okay? So a little bit about the course. Uh, this is real estate principles. Obviously, we're going to be talking about real estate, property, uh, transfer of property, uh, we're talking about buying and selling property, valuation of property, what is included in, in different types of property in real estate. Tonight, we're going to kind of go over some ground rules as far as what real estate is, how we transact real estate, and then we'll go into a little bit about ownership types of real estate. You may come into this class and think, you know what, this is one of these courses I just have to get through. Um, you Don't worry, don't feel alone. There are a handful of classes, no matter what your major is, that you'll come into and say, you know what, I don't know that I really am excited about taking this class. I just have to do it, right, for your degree. Um, I'm, I'm sympathetic to that because I, I've completed three different degrees. I've got two master's degrees and a, and a bachelor's. And through all those different degrees, there were always courses where, you know, it, it, at least initially, I didn't know if I'd be anxious to learn about. And I was just anxious to get through it. That's okay. Um, I'm not one of these crazy professors that thinks everybody has to love the material that I teach. Having said that, I'll try to make it interesting enough and memorable enough that you will take away some things from this course that whether or not you ever think that you'll be a real estate investor per se, um, at some point you'll probably have interactions with buying and selling property for yourself, right? So hopefully all of us will be homeowners at some point or property owners or even real estate investment owners. 
Um, not necessarily, but most of us will have some kind of interaction with buying and selling property. And if that's the case, there will be concepts in this course that will, that will help you uh, in that process. So hopefully you can come away with some information that would be, that would be helpful to, to your life, whether or not it's your career. That's not really the point. But there are some things in this course that could help you uh, going forward with just whatever you choose to do, um, maybe more in your personal life with buying and selling property over, over years. Um, so first question for all of you, uh, Susan, Doug, Marcia, and Andrea, and I'm sorry, Marcia, am I saying your name right, by the way? Okay, Marcia. Okay. So I'll continue to say it that way. Make sure and correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong. Okay. So for any of you, have any of you already bought or sold property yet? Bought or sold real estate? Sometimes in a class like this, no one has. Marcia, it looks like you have. That's great. Um, so out of the four of you, Marcia has bought or sold real estate before. Maybe, maybe you can help us a little bit later on, on kind of how that was and what that process was like. Um, for the rest of us, uh, you know, it, it may be new information as far as that concept of buying and selling property. It may kind of scare us. Some people, you know, get pretty intimidated by buying or selling property. And that's one of the many reasons maybe they stay and rent is because they just don't want to go through that process. They're worried about it. Hopefully this class will give you some background and information that will help you get, feel more comfortable with that. Marcy, I, I remember very clearly the first time I bought a property. Um, I actually was working with a, butter, a buddy of mine as a realtor that I, that I really trusted. And even though I really trusted my buddy as my, as my realtor, I still had a lot of anxiety, you know, about, about making that first purchase and signing all those documents um, can be kind of a scary thing. So uh, don't feel like you're alone or that you're a different because you are worried about buying or selling property. It's a big deal. Property transactions are, are big by their nature, right? They're, we're talking about a lot of money usually. And so that can be kind of a scary thing that, that comes, you know, that brings a lot of anxiety and, and fear with it as well. So the more you know about the process, and that's what the point of this class is, the more you know about property in general, real estate, and the process of buying and selling, should make that process, doesn't make necessarily make it easy, but it, it should make it less intimidating and less scary. So anyway, so that's kind of the, one of the points of this class. Now, I mentioned earlier, my name is Dave Shipley. I've been teaching through Steven Seneger for just over five years. Actually, this is the course that I originally taught five years ago when I first came on with Steven Seneger. And so it's kind of fun to go back to it. I've been teaching upper level finance classes over the past few years. Uh, and so it's a, it's a fun opportunity for me to go back to one of these management classes and especially, especially real estate as it was my first class that I taught uh, through Steven Seneger when I first started through them. So I've taught this course many times, um, but most recently I've been teaching uh, other finance classes. Um, as far as my day job, I'm a, I'm a certified financial planner with Zions Bank. And so I help people with investments in estate planning and, and insurance and, and tax issues and meet one-on-one -on -one with those people. And many times our planning has to do with real estate. So even though I'm not a realtor or an appraiser or some kind of real estate pro professional per se, many of my clients are real estate investors. And many of my clients will come to me and have me analyze uh, the buying or selling of a property that they're in the midst of. And, and an example of that just from a few weeks ago, I had a couple who's been renting for 20, 30 years. They're in their 70s actually but they just barely accomplished or, or received a, an insurance settlement that allowed them or afforded them the opportunity for the first time in many, many years to buy a house. And of course, they were excited to do that and pay cash for a home, which is a really unique opportunity. Most of my clients can't pay cash for houses. Um, but in this case, they weren't having to borrow any money. They were just going to pay some cash. But they came to me multiple times before they bought their home to review uh, the process and review what the other person's agent was telling him. And there were a lot of different things or details that I was able to help them with. So for example, first time for them in a long time that they had bought a house, they weren't, they weren't really familiar with the process of, of making an offer, you know, giving some earnest money, and then going through that, that process of maybe getting an inspection or an appraisal and the importance of an inspection or appraisal and the importance of a title company running title search for the property. And we'll, we'll go over all those different steps and the reason why they're so important in this course. Um, but anyway, in the end, we were able to give them some good feedback. They were really happy with the house, even though I felt like the, the person's agent, they, they didn't have an agent. They were just using 
you know, the other person's agent. I felt like they took advantage of him in some ways, and we can go through the specifics of why I thought that. Uh, in the end, I think they got a fair price, not the best price, but a fair price and a, and a fair transaction. So anyway, there, there are a lot of different pieces of that process that, that you know, like I say, the more we know about it, the, the more we can uh, be informed and, and we can make sure that we're not getting taken advantage of in any way. And uh, we make that uh, a, a smooth, smooth as possible, even though, like I say, there still might be some anxiety with it. Marcia, have you uh, bought and sold a few different houses or, or are you still in the first one that you ever purchased? Maybe we caught her walking away for just a second. Okay, so you bought two and sold one. So you're in your second home or second purchase then at this point? Okay, and was the second one a little bit less scary than the first one? <laughs> yes, exclamation point, right? Just much easier because we know what to look for. Um, you know, we know what we like and dislike. You know, one of the things that, that happens when, when you buy that first home is you think you have an idea of exactly what you want. And then you get into it and you start finding just details that you don't like about it, details that you do like. And it just helps to inform you for your next purchase, right? Where you, where you do a better job on your next home getting exactly what you want. Some, it's, it's almost impossible to get exactly what you want the very first time. You know, it's a lot easier to, to, to learn from that first one. And then, and then the second, third, fourth, you know, houses later, you're, you're, you're getting better and better as far as your choices and, and the process too. So you did new home construction on the first one. Wow. It's pretty bold. Allows you to pick out a lot of your own things maybe. Good. Okay. So we need to go over some of the ground rules for the course real quick, some of the basic expectations. And I apologize for some of you who have taken courses online before. Some of this is going to be repetitive with other classes that you've had. But if we can get through it tonight, hopefully I won't have to do it in future, um, future weeks, future sessions. Um, just as a small housekeeping item, we will have this session every Monday at 8 o'clock. So for some of you, that just won't work. And that's okay. You don't have to attend the live session um, I think it's beneficial because you can ask questions and we can discuss things in person. But if you can't make it, that's okay. Review the, the recorded session, which I'll always post after our live session on Mondays. Next Monday is Columbus Day. And although it is Columbus Day, I'll still be, we'll still have our normal time and day uh, for Columbus Day. And like I say, I, looking out on the calendar, it appears at this point that we'll just be always doing Mondays at 8 o'clock Mountain Standard Time. If like I say, I need to change that. I'll, I'll post it, announce it, and email everyone a heads up on that, okay? All right, so a couple things. First of all, in a course like this, um, the, the main reason that people fail a course like this is they just don't get in their work, and, and that should seem pretty straightforward, but some people get fearful when they come into a class like this that they might not, they might not be able to get the material. They might not understand it well enough to pass the class, and it's in my experience over over you know, now it's been more than 100 modules that I've, that I've taught through online courses like this. It's my experience that, that people don't fail these classes because they, they have a hard time learning or that they, you know, they feel like it's a difficult material. They fail these classes because they give up at some point and they don't turn in their work. Um, so if you, if you have the goal just to pass the class, I'd say that's a pretty low bar. And, and really all you have to do is make sure that you follow instructions and turn in all your work. Okay, just complete everything. You'll have three assignments, you'll have three discussion boards, you'll have daily checkpoints, and you'll have weekly assessments for all four weeks. If you just accomplish those simple things, and I say they're simple, I know some of them are challenging and more challenging for some of you than others, but if you set aside time each day to, to work on these things and stay caught up in the class, you'll pass. Um, that's not a guarantee, but it's been my experience that if somebody turns everything in and tries to follow the instructions, they'll probably pass the class. What happens a lot of times is they get, you know, a little bit behind and then at, by the end of the class, they feel like they just don't have enough time to finish and that's why they end up giving up and sometimes not passing because of that. So stay with us, stay, you know, caught up, um, you know, put in the effort, especially early on to stay caught up and, and you'll be in great shape. Now, some of you don't just want to pass the class and I understand that and, and some of you really would like an A from this class. Um, I, I will say that I don't make it, you know, I don't curve the scores to make sure that not too many people get A's. It would be my um, 
you know, I'd love it if everybody would work really hard and everybody would like an A. Uh, and everybody would do the work necessary to get an A. We'd all like an A, right, Marcia? But but sometimes we don't put in the necessary effort to make sure and get an A. But what I'm what I'm going to commit to you tonight, as your professor, as the instructor for the course, is that if you will put in sufficient effort by following instructions, turning things in on time, and accomplishing all your work in this class, and putting the the effort that I that I ask you to put into it, you'll get an A in the class. Uh, it's not a difficult class. It's just like any other class. If you get everything in, you follow the instructions, you're careful about your work, you study the required readings and, and the information, you, you review the sessions and take some notes about the assessments. You can even, you know, accidentally have a bad assessment, you know, throughout the course and still, you know, you'll still get your A if, if you've really put sufficient effort into everything else. One of the main things that helps people get an A these last few years is the college um, just the last couple years has, has instituted these daily checkpoints. And of course, for most of you, checkpoints have probably been around the entire time you've been a student. But for me, the first couple years that I taught, checkpoints didn't exist. And so we would try to come up with creative ways to do extra credit or something like that or get extra points. But reality is, when with the checkpoints, with the daily checkpoints, the easiest way to get a half a letter grade worth of extra credit in this class is to just do your checkpoints every day. And not only just do them, but spend a little bit of time. You don't have to read, you know, word for word and really study out the, the section, although it would be helpful to do that. But just take a few extra seconds on each one of the checkpoints to make sure that you're getting, you're understanding the question, and getting exactly what the question is asking for. You know, the faster you do them, sometimes you'll get a few wrong. And then that's missing out on some of those points that you could have gotten for extra credit. When you get the extra credit from the checkpoints, it gives you some cushion, right? gives you some much needed cushion of points so that when you get to the end, even if you struggled on a test or two or struggled on an assignment, those checkpoints will give you the extra points you need to still pull off the grade that you were looking for. Okay? Any questions to this point about checkpoints, about getting an A versus passing the class versus failing the class? Of course, everybody at this point, it's early, right? We're all trying to get an A from the class, and I appreciate that. Um, and the biggest issue is just, just stay up on your work. Okay, so no questions so far. We'll, we'll keep stopping for, for little breaks to, to ask if you have any. So if, if things come up or you think of something to ask, make sure and do it. So along those lines, I mentioned to get an A, you turn your work in on time, you follow instructions, you put in the sufficient effort, and you get all your work in. To pass the class, we just need all your work in, right? I didn't say it had to be on time. I will still grade things if they're late. I will not give full credit. I have to give a discount. It's school policy to discount your work if you don't turn it in on time. Having said that, you'll still get most of the credit. And so, you know, to make it fair to those of us who, who turn things in on time, they can get full credit. If you turn it in late, you can't get full credit. And the longer you get or the further you get away from the due date, the, the, the further I have to discount your score. But even if it's, you know, fairly late, meaning, you know, it was due week one and you turn it in in week three or something like that, so a few weeks late, I can still give you, you know, the bulk of the points and at least enough to, to be, still be on track to pass the class. So don't ever become discouraged in a class like this by, by falling behind as far as not turning in your work in on time. I'll accept work no matter when you turn it in all the way up till the, the last day of the class. It's just the further you get, the, the, the more of a score deduction I have to take on your work, okay? So then it's worth noting that in week four on Saturday at midnight, the class is officially over, right? And, and Andrea, just for your sake, and, and should be the, you know, should be a review for the other three. In a class like this, when you get to week four, that is a absolute hard and fast cutoff. I have to submit grades that next day, and I can't have people submitting work that Sunday or that next Monday for credit. So even though I've told you that, that late work can be accepted, the final cutoff is that f week four, you know, Saturday at midnight. After that, I cannot accept any, any additional work, okay? And that's just hard and fast, no exceptions. Now, for some of you, life will, will happen this, this mod, right? Uh, you'll get sick, you'll have family issues, a friend or family member will get hurt, there'll be somebody in the hospital, something will happen with work or at home with family members. Anyway, there's all kinds of different things that could come up during a course like this. And a course like this, since it's only four weeks, goes really, really fast, 
right? Or at least it feels fast to me as the instructor. And when I was taking courses in this format, it always felt like the four weeks started kind of slow, but it always ended really fast on me. So I would just caution you to not get too far behind in your work because then those emergencies can come up near the end and it sometimes creates a situation where we can't get our work done in time. We just can't. And then we end up failing a class. And, and these classes are, way, are far too expensive, right? To waste, you know, four weeks on them. We really want to make sure that everybody accomplishes and, and succeeds in these classes so that you get what you're paying for, right? And don't have to retake classes and just waste time and effort and energy. So, I just, I just encourage you to stay caught up so that, you know, when those, when those emergencies do come up, which they always do, right? If something can go wrong with a computer or with a family member or with, you know, work or with our health, seems like it will, okay? But that doesn't have to stop you from getting through a class like this. If you plan and prepare and really effort things as you go, those, those kinds of things shouldn't stop you from getting through the class and also getting the score that you want, okay? All right, so let's talk about a couple more things. We've got the weekly discussion boards. This week's weekly discussion board talks about um, ownership types. So that's from chapter four of the ebook. So ownership types is what that's talking about. We should have a few minutes to discuss different ownership types tonight. So we'll get into that a little bit and help you out with the discussion board. So a couple things that are, that are consistent on discussion boards and should have been consistent with any other online class that you've ever taken, and that is, to get full credit on the discussion board, you've got to do a few things. One is you have to have a discussion post in by Wednesday at midnight every week. So your first post needs to be in by Wednesday at midnight, and it needs to speak to or answer the question of the discussion board. So this week, we're asking you to, to talk about the different ownership types for real estate. So that would be your first post, would be discussing the different ownership types. That would be considered your main post as well, the post that you know is worth most of the points. Then, by, the, by Saturday at midnight, we'll want you to add at least two more responses, okay, to other people's posts or to my posts throughout the week. And so, if you've got two responses and a main discussion board comment done, all three, by the end of the week, Saturday at midnight, you'll get full credit for the discussion board. And there are a few other nuances. So, that Wednesday one has to be done by Wednesday at midnight, okay, for full credit. You have to have at least three posts, two of which need to be responses, one of which needs to be considered a main post. And that main post needs to have two to three paragraphs at least, and at least one reference, okay? At least one reference in that main post, okay? So for your main post to get full credit, it needs to be two to three paragraphs. It needs to be fairly su substantive. There's a word requirement. I usually don't count words, but if your post is obviously very, very short, I cannot give you full credit. You have to make it pretty substantive so that I can give you full credit for that main post. And then you need to have at least one reference. Now, just a word of warning. Discussion boards are not places to go online and cut and paste whatever information you can find from online and just paste it in to the discussion board, okay? I will not give you credit if you're cutting and pasting onto the discussion board. The whole point of the discussion board is for us to discuss, right? For us to, to review our opinions and our information and our own unique writing and our own unique voice. So I don't want cutting and pasting. What I do want is for you to do research online, get ideas and information from online, refer to those ideas by properly referencing, you know, material that you find online, but try to stay away from cutting and pasting, try to stay away from even quoting that material word for word. I'd much rather have it in your own writing, in your own wording, uh, because that's the point is to try to think through and formulate your own thoughts and opinions. That's what the discussion board is all about. Okay, so one of, the, one of the places that a lot of people get hung up on the discussion board is on the main post when they're trying to answer that question, do the research, a lot of times they'll just cut and paste or quote, you know, a lot of information from what they find online. That's fine, okay, to take some of that information. However, I need the bulk of your main post to be your own writing in your own voice. And it can be material you found online, but you need to put it in your own words and make it your own thoughts, okay? Any questions on the discussion board? What I expect from the discussion board as far as your opinions and discussion? I will, I'll commit to you that the discussion board will be a lot more fulfilling. You'll get a lot more from the discussion board if you put a little bit of thought into it and actually think through the discussion that's taking place. Um, you know, I realize that there'll be a handful of you that will just jump through the hoops to, to pass this class and get through it. 
But if you're interested at all in really learning and trying to grow from a class like this and getting your money's worth, the discussion board can be a great place to ask me questions and, con and have concerns and then respond to your peers and really benefit each other through, you know, a collection of, of, of people's experiences. And, and while I'm on that, um, keep in mind that one of the things that you can always add to a discussion board that I think always adds a lot of great um, value to a discussion board is your own personal experiences. Okay. So if you're willing to share them, I, I don't require it, but if you're willing to share your own personal experiences about any of the things that any of the topics that are the discussion board topic for the week, I'd strongly encourage you to do that. I think it really helps out for the board. Okay. And all of us have probably had discussion board classes that are really, really good. And then classes where our discussion boards, we felt like weren't very helpful. And I, I want this to be a class where you come away saying, wow, that was, that was great. You know, I got questions answered. I felt like, you know, people were positive. They were giving a lot of good information. They were efforting, you know, the, their opinions and information. It was a good place to discuss. So that's, that's what I hope for from the discussion board. And we'll see how this first week goes. But like I say, just make sure and fulfill the minimum expectations. Three posts, you know, one main post, two, three paragraphs with at least one reference, one post in by Wednesday, all three done by Saturday, and you should be in good shape and then we'll go from there. Okay. All right. So that's discussion boards. The second easiest way to get points in the class beyond checkpoints is discussion boards. So please, please, please stay consistent on discussion boards and checkpoints. And that just can mean a world of difference for your score, you know, in a class like this. Then we get to assignments. This week's assignment is a two page paper. It is supposed to be a uh, uh, your feedback or your writing about an interview that you have with a real estate professional. I emailed the entire class out today because I wanted to give everybody a fair warning that that is going to require that interview so that we don't get to Saturday and then try to get a realtor on the phone on Saturday when it's, when it's, you know, 10 o'clock at night because we thought we could just do the assignment real quick. Um, but let's talk a little bit more about the, the assignment. So two pages, double spaced, 12 point font, Times New Roman, you know, don't don't change the font when you're doing a paper, a research paper in a class like this. And then you're going to be referencing your interview, the information from your interview, okay, for that paper. So two pages. So that that's going to take some content. You can also look up some peripheral content online, you know, from from online sources like your state government website. We'll have information on how to license, for example, in real estate to be an appraiser or realtor or mortgage broker or something like that. Um, I, I'd, I'd prefer you to get most of your information from a short interview with a realtor. So hopefully you have a friend or family member that's in real estate in some way that you can interview. If not, don't worry. Um, go ahead and use the, the, you know, an online yellow pages of sorts to, to search out maybe a realtor in your area that you can just talk to for five or 10 minutes. And I, and I would call them and just say, hey, you know, I, I don't know if this is a good time or not, but, but I'd love to visit with you for five or 10 minutes for a class that I'm taking on real estate. And I wonder if this is a good time or if I can call you back at a better time. So that's how I would introduce, you know, an interview to somebody who I had never met before. Some of you will have friends and family, like I say, and that will be really easy. But some of you will have to call a realtor out of the blue, you know, and like I say, I would just say, hey, my name is such and such. I'm in a real estate principals class through an online school and I need to do a five to 10 minute interview with a real estate professional. I wonder if this is a good time or if there's a better time I can call you back. Okay. And then you could set up a time that's, that's mutually, you know, convenient for the two of you. All right. So then when you get to the interview, when you're actually asking questions, the assignment itself does give you some ideas on what we want you to ask about. For example, how you become a real estate professional, what kind of licensing is required for your particular state. Okay. And I would parlay that or, or extend that when you're talking to them about maybe how they got into real estate, you know, ask them what their story is. How did you ever get into real estate? What made you think, you know, to, to be a realtor, for example? And then how has your career been? Has it been something that you feel like was a good career for you? Uh, has it been a challenging career? Have there been times where you've struggled um, you know, what are the hardest things about your career? You know, just, just treat it like a, a regular interview with, a, with some kind of professional where you're trying to find out what they like, what they dislike about their job, uh, what kind of challenges are out there with their job, how the competition is with their job, um, you know, how easy it is to make a good living 
uh, those kinds of things can all come out in an interview and then you can be done, you know, five or six minutes later and put that information down on paper. If you're not at two pages, you can go ahead and do a little bit more research online to figure out a little bit more as far as statistics and information when it comes to real estate professionals in your state. Okay. Any questions about this week's paper, uh, your assignment for week one? Okay. Not yet. Good, Doug. Well, if you do, zip me a quick email. I'd be happy to, to answer any questions that you have. Yes, Andrea, let's do it by Saturday at midnight. So that's one of the reasons that I, once again, I emailed out today, everybody, because I realize if you start this on Friday or Saturday that it might be kind of difficult to get that interview part done. If you get your interview part done early this week, it would be a lot easier to write the paper and, and just finish the paper later on. Okay. One more quick thing, and, and I'm sure most of you all know this, but when you write a two-page paper or when a two-page paper is required, just keep in mind, okay, just keep in mind that two pages is two full pages of writing. Okay, so if you're doing APA format, you might have a title page. You might have a reference page, right? Those don't count towards your two-page requirement. We're talking about a full two pages of writing. If we only get a page of writing or a page and a half, I can't give you full credit. The minimum requirement for this particular assignment is two full pages of writing, okay? All right, that's this week's assignment. Keep in mind that the assignments, between the three assignments, represent more than a third of your score at the end of this class, okay? So each one of them is worth more than one letter grade to your score, each one of these assignments. So do not take lightly the assignments. They're, they're not as easy as the discussion boards and the, and the checkpoints every day, but they are definitely uh, one of the most important parts of a course like this as far as scores and points are concerned. You know, like I say, representing more than a third of your overall all score will be these assignments. Okay, any other questions or concerns about the assignment for this week or future weeks? You are able to look ahead for future assignments, but there's no guarantee that I might not change a little bit about the assignment instructions. You know, I, I usually don't make a significant or wholesale change about instructions, but, but I usually will review, you know, coming into each week the assignment, and I make, might make some updates. And so I'll let you know if I've updated anything on the assignment for the week uh, early. And then, like I say, we'll talk about it each week on Monday to make sure that if you have any questions or concerns about the assignment that we can get them answered early on. Okay. Does everybody feel comfortable with what the what is required from this week's assignment? And any questions on how to contact a realtor or appraiser as far as a real estate professional to accomplish the assignment? Okay, if you have any, just zip me a quick email, let me know, and we'll try to answer the best we can and get you the information that you need. Okay, so that's assignments. Then we get to assessments. Uh, week one is a pretty short assessment like we've talked about, or a weekly quiz. Um, it's going to be only five questions. Uh, it's only worth 50 points, so it's not a significant part of your grade, but it is, um, you know, every point helps like we've talked about. It probably will only take about 10 minutes of your time, if I were to guess. Um, if you've read through chapters two and four, which are the required readings for this week, and if you have some notes, and if you've taken down a few notes from tonight's discussion, you'll be in great shape, okay, for that test. Um, next week will be a midterm, okay, so a little bit more valuable and comprehensive over the first two weeks. The third week will just be over the content for week three, and then week four will be a final that will be comprehensive over all the material that we've learned in the course, okay? But over a four-week period of time, it's pretty easy to retain it. However, in week four, we'll spend considerable time and effort in that week four session preparing you with everything you need to know as far as the topics for that test, okay? So don't stress about the final test. It's worth a lot of points. It's a bigger test. It's got more questions, but we'll get you well prepared for it that week, that final week. Okay. Elvisa, welcome. I didn't, I didn't see that you'd popped in. I hope that you can hear okay and that you've been able to, to join now for a little bit. You can go ahead and, and review the recorded session that I'll be posting online to get the first part of the session, um, you know, later tonight if you'd like or sometime later this week. All right, so I think we're done with all the housekeeping items that I wanted to cover as far as the minimum expectations, the different 
components of the course that are required, um, how I score different things. Like I say, I do accept late work. I just can't give full credit. Um, if you really struggle with an assignment or an assessment, be in touch with me. We can potentially find a way to, to make up or redo that assessment or assignment in a one-off situation. You know, if you really just, just struggled with one, then we can usually do something about that. Keep in mind that I will grade everything by Tuesday at noon each week from the week before. And um, I will grade everything that was turned in on time, I should say, by Tuesday at noon. Things that are turned in late, there's no guarantee how soon I'll grade them. I'll just get to them when I can. But all grading on on-time work will be done by Tuesday at noon of the following week. And I usually do wait to grade everything together so that I can be more fair about the scoring. I find when I score things, you know, with time in between, sometimes I can't stay as consistent with how I score things. So I like to score everything together, if possible, at the end of the week. Uh, quick questions. All the assessments are going to be on Wednesday. No, assessments are, you can accomplish any time during the week, Andrea, all the way up till Saturday at midnight each week. So you've got a discussion board comment that's due every week by Wednesday, but that's the only thing that's due by Wednesday. Um, everything else as far as your coursework will be due by Saturday at midnight each week. Okay? So you've got all week for the week one assessment. Okay. And... Um, like I say, chapters two and four are the content for this week. Um, the ebook chapters are, are just, if I'm not mistaken, it's like PDF files basically that you can read through uh, at your own leisure and get that information that you need. But I want to talk about a few things. We don't have a lot of time tonight because we spend so much time the first week talking about some housekeeping issues. Um, but I do want to talk about some basic definitions and maybe a little bit about ownership, and then we'll spend just the last few minutes, right at about 9 o'clock, we'll spend the last few minutes going over the five questions that will be on the test and giving you the exact topics that you'll need to know for the test. All right, so chapter two. When we talk about land, it, we do differentiate the difference between land and property and real estate, okay? So make sure that you're defining things correctly. Land is, is something that can be improved, it can have fixtures on it, and whether or not the fixtures are part of the property or considered part of the land or whether or not they're not considered part of the land is, is uh, determined by this manner of attachment test, basically. So there's these rules that you can go over. Um, so how the, the actual object was adapted to the property, if it was adapted to the property, then it's, then it's a fixture of the property. If it's not adapted to the property and it can be removed easily, then usually it's not considered a fixture of the property or part of the land, okay? So an example that the book gives, I think, is, you know, a garden hose. A garden hose is fixed on right to the property. It's, it's screwed into the property, but it's not adapted to the property. A garden hose can be used on any property, right? So if you were buying a piece of property or a piece of land, they would, it would be assumed that the garden hose would not be included in the purchase unless it was agreed upon otherwise, right? So some people still leave things like that. That's not to say that, you know, sometimes when we buy a property or a piece of land that they don't leave some of the, the, the personal property associated, you know, on the property. But as far as the contract, the buy and sell contract is concerned when it comes to real estate, the, how something's attached or how th something's been adapted does make a difference in whether or not it's assumed to be part of the contract or not. Another example that is assumed to be part of the property would be like a cement pad, of course, right? Nobody's going to take their cement pad with them when they move, <laughs> or they shouldn't at least. And so a cement pad would be considered a fixture of the property, even though it's an improvement on the property that the person actually did and they paid for it, it would be assumed that that cement pad, you know, would, be, would stay with the property. Another thing that would be assumed to stay with the property would actually be a shed if it's built for the property, right? So if it's anchored into the property. Now there are removable sheds that wouldn't be considered part of the property. Something like a trampoline might not be considered part of the property. Something like a play set, you know, outside in the backyard might not be considered part of the property. Um, then something like a refrigerator or a washer and a dryer set, those things probably will not be considered part of the property, right? They can be removed very easily and they're not just specifically to that property. However, 
you've got shelves, right? Shelves that you might buy at Ikea and put together. Those shelves would be considered personal property and would, wouldn't stay with the property unless otherwise specified. But built-in shelving, okay, it would be assumed that you're not going to take the shelves out of built-in shelving and take them with you, right? So it's pretty easy, you know, it's pretty, pretty straightforward what kinds of things are considered part of land and are fixtures of a property versus personal property. Personal property is assumed to not be part of a purchase contract unless specified, where fixtures are assumed to stay with the property unless otherwise specified. And that's why we've got that second bullet point that says existence of a, an agreement. You can agree through a purchase agreement to take any piece of personal property and make it a fixture of the property, okay? So through the, the selling contract, you can, you can, or the purchase contract, you can actually take anything, garden hose, whatever it is, and make it part of the property based on the agreement. And then there might be a relationship of the parties that, that creates that, um, that reason for something be con being considered a fixture instead of a, of a personal property. Okay, so what about like shrubs and trees? Anybody want to take a stab at that? Are shrubs and trees personal property or are they fixtures of a property that would be part of a property when that gets sold? Trees and shrub, shrubs, yes, of course, right? We're not going to dig up our shrub and take it with us. And if we do, okay, it needs to be part of our purchase agreement. It needs to be written into our contract because the buyer will assume that you're not going to be taking your shrubs and trees. Those are things that should stay with the property unless otherwise specified. Good. All right, so something real quick just to, to chat about for a second. One of the things that, that a lot of people don't really understand about property, if I buy a piece of land, it's assumed that I have the air rights and subsurface rights to that piece of property unless otherwise specified. So one of the things that I do for my job is every other week I go out to the basin, what we call the basin in Utah, which is eastern Utah, and it, and it encompasses uh, Duchesne, Roosevelt, and Vernal which all three of those cities are basically exist because of the oil industry out there. Now, if I were to go buy a piece of land out in Duchesne, Roosevelt, or Vernal, in most cases, that property would not include mineral rights or subsurface rights. What does that mean? It means that somebody's bought that property back in the day and they will, they're willing to sell me the, the surface rights and the air rights to that property, but they will not include, they will maintain or, or preserve the, the mineral rights for themselves. And all that means to me is if, if they ever find oil underneath my property, right, they have, the, they have the ability to mine for that oil or mine for those minerals without having to pay me anything, unless, it's just, unless it's, there's just access to my property, which they can sometimes pay for. But as far as the actual mineral rights, those would be somebody else's, okay? So something to consider when you buy a property or a piece of land is whether or not you're getting all rights to that property. If you get all rights to the property, you have air rights, you have the right to the air above your property, and you have the right to the, the minerals and the earth below that property, okay, as well as what you would assume you have, which is the surface, surface of the property. We all know the surface of the property, but sometimes we, we don't think through water rights, mineral rights, those kinds of things that can be subsurface rights, as well as air rights. You know, people have to pay, right? People have to pay you to put a, a cell phone tower on your property, even though the tower itself only takes up just a small little little piece of, of, of your land, right, for the pole part. They still have to pay a lease payment to you because you actually own the property, the air property that they're in uh, with their tower as well. Okay, kind of a strange concept, but something to keep in mind. Water rights, we're not going to go into the definitions of all the different water rights. It is something to, to look at, though. We talk about meets and bounds. We're talking about distance, and we're talking about um, coordinates, okay? So it used to be that in the olden days, when, it, when we were exchanging property or buying and selling property, we would look at what they refer to as monuments or different, like a tree, for example, would become a monument of one person's property line versus another's, or or, you know, some kind of strange rock formation or something like that because they didn't have very good uh, mapping, right? They didn't have exact coordinates. And so you would have a situation where a lot of times 
property rights would be argued over, right? Because we didn't know exactly where one property began and one, when another one ended. And so a lot of people would fight about property rights. People still fight about property rights today, but meets and bounds and specific coordinates have allowed people to be more um, uh, definite and specific and detailed about where one property begins and one ends, okay? They can come out and, and they can appraise exactly where your property starts and where the next one, next one begins, okay? Okay, you've got parcels like this, meets and bounds, your corners would be the bounds, your meets would be the distance, right? And then you end up with these plats of property or plots of property that define one property to the next, okay? And it can be very, very accurate, right? Very specific and detailed and accurate because of how well we could, our measurements and meets and bounds are nowadays. Okay, this talks about direction. This gives you a map of the entire United States as far as public land is concerned and how they break it up. It's kind of interesting. It's part of your reading, so don't, don't get worried about making sure that you have, um, you know, notes on each one of these screens or that you have to memorize them. So then you have townships that they divide into sections, okay, different sections of a town or city. And each one of the sections, okay, is divided up into divisions. And each one of the, the subdivisions is divided up into plats, okay? And these are actually different lots where people will build or have their homes. So you could be like lot five, for example, and that would be the smallest Right. Those are different names of the different lots. We won't go over those. We've got assessor maps. Something I think is, is helpful to go over is the physical characteristics of land that makes it different than most other types of investments and most other types of property that we can own. First of all, land, of course, is immobile. We can't take land and move it to somewhere else. So if I own a plot of land, an acre of property, I can't take that acre and move it somewhere else, right? And that's actually different when it comes to property. Most property is mobile, but land is not, okay? It's indestructible. So you can damage a home on a property. You can damage the crops on a property. You can damage everything about the property, but you cannot destroy completely that surface area of the earth, right? That surface area of the earth will always be there. So it's indestructible, which makes it very unique to most property. Most property is destructible, okay? If I go out and buy a stock, okay, and that, that company goes to zero or they go bankrupt, my property is destroyed. It's gone. Or if I go and buy a bicycle, okay, somebody can steal that bike from me. Somebody can throw that bike off a cliff. Somebody can set that bike on fire, okay? There's all kinds of things that can happen that can destroy most property. Land is indestructible, okay? The stuff on the land could be destructible, but the land itself is not destructible. And then non-homogeneity. And what, what, this is just a big word for saying that there's no two pieces of property that are identical, right? If you take the surface area of the, of the world, there's no two pieces of property that are in the exact same spot and have the exact same features, right? And that's also unique to property. Most property does have homogeneity, meaning you can have homogeneous uh, uh, property. So if I own one share of Walmart, somebody else can own one share of Walmart, and there is no difference between those two identical shares of Walmart. I can hold $10 in my hand, you can hold $10 in your hand. Those, there's no difference between the $10 that you're holding as far as value and as far as its features than my $10 that I'm holding, okay? Land is different. Every single plot or property is unique, okay? Just like every human being is unique, right? But when it comes to something that you can own, like property of some kind, land is unique that way. Um, it's like original paintings, right? There's no two original paintings <laughs> or it wouldn't be an original painting. And the same is true for property. There's no two identical pieces of property. And because of these things, 
a lot of the value of property or the value of land comes from those things. Okay. And it creates economic value. Okay. Land and property have economic value because of those things, those characteristics that we just described it creates scarcity, right? By default, you can't have more land. Okay. The surf, the surface area of the earth is not expanding. Okay. So there's, there's built in scarcity. There's modification that you can improve and, and, and develop land and make it more valuable based on what you do to the land and what you put on it. And fixity just has to do with the fact that there's no, there, you know, it's, it's a fixed location and there's no way to duplicate exactly what you've got. Okay. Okay, so that's chapter two. Wanted to go through that fairly quickly. We did. We've only got about five more minutes. So let's just review quickly some basic property types and then we'll be done. Okay, and you'll want to read about these property types and make sure you have a basic understanding about these property types. Um, pretty straightforward. Uh, there are a few of additional property types that aren't listed here that the book does talk about, so keep those in mind. But you've got basically a few different property types, and as an aside, just keep in mind that these property types apply to more than just land or real estate right? I can own any kind of property in one of these property type, uh, property types or ownership types, I should say. Sole ownership, this is where you have all the liability, you have all the responsibility, you also have all the control, right? So you have good things about it because you get to control it, but you also have some negatives where you have all the liability of that property and you also have all um, of the responsibilities associated with that property. Liability from a standpoint of somebody suing you, or somebody bringing claims against you. Um, responsibility as far as care of the property, that's all you, right? If you're a sole proprietor or sole owner. Um, and, uh, and, and, but you also have complete control, and so that's one of the advantages of sole ownership. Sole ownership by default does not inherently have a beneficiary. So if something happens to you, there's a problem because property does not allow you in title if you're a sole owner to, to have a beneficiary like, an, like a savings account or an IRA would, okay? So sole proprietorships or sole ownerships arrangements have an inherent problem with transition, okay? And succession. There's no built-in succession if something happens to you on a sole ownership piece of property. That's where the state has to get involved, and that's where probate has to get involved if it's a sole owner property. Then you have tenants in common, joint tenancy. Um, tenants in common and tenants in the entirety and joint tenancy are all different joint ownerships where you can have one more than one owner, and some of them are only for married couples, and some of them are not for married couples. I mean, they're just different arrangements, the most common of which is joint tenancy with right of survivorship. Joint tenant with rights or survivorship just means that you're equal owners during life, and then if one of you passes away, your ownership is relinquished to whoever the joint is. So, for example, if my wife and I own our, our home, which we do, we're joint owners, we're equal owners in life, and if something were to happen to me or if something were to happen to her, the entirety of the value of the property would then become hers or become mine if one of us passed away, Okay. Would that work in a, like a second marriage situation or in a situation where you're not related? Maybe not, right? You might not want that type of joint ownership if you're not related or if you don't intend to have ownership flow to the other person. If you want to keep it preserved for your own beneficiaries, then you'd need to use a different type of ownership. Community property versus single property states. Just be aware of whether or not your state, okay, the state you live in, because it's different with every state, is a joint uh, community property state or a single sole owner state. If you live in a community property state, whether or not you put ownership in joint ownership or not, the state will deem that property to be what's considered community property 50-50 between married spouses, okay? If you're in a non-community property state, then that's not assumed, okay? It's not assumed joint ownership between spouses. So that's something unique to, to find out tonight is whether or not your state is community property state or not. And then what does that mean for you and how you title your property? Uh, because some people worry about that. They title things separately in a, in a marriage because they don't want, you know, shared or joint assets. 
But if you're in a community property state and you, and you acquired that property while you were married, those community property estates will assume that it's jointly held. Okay, so be careful on that. And then you've got things like partnerships and corporations, LLCs and trusts that you can own property in that allow you to take some of the legal liability away and protect yourself legally. And also it can put that property in a separate entity so that it can pass to your heirs or to whoever, whomever else without ha you having to die at any point. It's easier to transition property when it's inside of one of these, you know, entities like a corporation, trust, or LLC, limited liability uh, corporate company, okay? So those are some of the different ownership types that you have um, available to you when you're owning property. Okay. Any questions about different ownership types? I know we didn't go into a lot of detail. Just wanted to give you a quick overview before you get to the reading this week. Um, there will be a, a question or two on the test about ownership types. And then, of course, you're going to be spending some time on the discussion board about ownership types. So uh, should be in good shape there. Okay, if no questions on that, let's get to what you need to know for the test. There, like I mentioned before, only five questions, so a pretty straightforward, pretty easy test this week. Having said that, because it's so easy and short, do not get uh, falsely um, complacent about, you know, studying for it. Still do your studying. On number one on the test, you're going to want to know the difference between personal property, okay, and what's considered a fixture or a part of real estate. And this is back to a conversation we had earlier in chapter two. The book is very clear on this. It lists out different examples of things that are fixtures of a property, part of the real estate, and then things that are not part of the real estate, okay? And you'll need to know the difference between those and some examples of them. We gave the example of trees and shrubs. Just keep in mind that that would help you for the test knowing that example. Um, you'll want to know concurrent interest in real property. What does that mean, concurrent interest? Another way of saying that is concurrent ownership of property. So if you have concurrent ownership, what does that mean when it comes to property? And that will be in Chapter 4. You'll want to know what concurrent interest or concurrent ownership means, what it entails before you get to the test. You'll want to know the tests of a fixture. Okay, the tests of a fixture. So back, uh, a few slides back in chapter two, there were the different tests of whether or not something's a fixture or not. One was adaptation. One was an agreement. One was uh, relationship. So you'll want to know all the different tests that the book reviews and be able to identify tests of a, of, of, um, of a fixture, whether or not something's a fixture of a real estate property or not. Okay. So you'll want to know those tests. Um, you'll want to know what the most widely recognized aspect of joint tenancy is. Okay. So what is the most widely recognized? What's the most widely used or recognized part of joint tenancy? And the book is very clear on this. So what is the most important or widely recognized part of joint tenancy as far as an ownership type? Then you want to know what um, the book has to say, and this is from chapter two. When you have like rights, right of way or an easement or um, yeah, basically just an easement or right of way for something on your property, what are those called? So let's say you're going to buy a condo in a condo housing project and your condo property has a backyard but also has a walking path that goes through it because that walking path goes through the entire property, let's say, and it has to go through your backyard. That's, that's a right of way or an easement on your property. What is the terminology? What is the word that describes those types of contract features? Um, you know, right of ways or easements on your property. What is the terminology for that or the vocabulary word that the book tells you about that that describes those types of things. It's a one word vocabulary word from or term from chapter two that would include rights of way or easements. Okay, make sure you know that before you get to the test and you'll get that one right. So that's all five questions. Any questions about what is going to be on the test? It's pretty simple this week. There's only a few. 
Um, but if you know those topics I just gave you, you'll be in great shape. All right, any questions before we wrap up tonight? Concerns? It is multiple choice. Every single one of them will be multiple choice. Anything else? Okay, zip me a quick email this week if you have any other concerns or questions. Have a great week. We'll talk to you throughout the week, either by email or on the discussion board, and I wish you the best of luck. And then we'll talk next week on Monday uh, for next week's session. Have a great night, and we'll talk to you later.